I'm Bob and welcome to Healing School. Every Thursday here at Grace City Church, we hold Healing School because we want you healed. We want you to receive the word, the, the, the perfect will of God for you, for healing. And that's what we do. That's all we do at Healing School is talk about healing, talk about those things that can bring healing to your body. One of the things that I have been doing for quite some time now, and we're getting ready to wind it down, I have been going through this book by F.F. Bosworth called Christ the Healer. This is a tremendous book. I think everyone should have it in their library. And we're coming to the end of it. And this last chapter, excuse me, this last chapter is about Paul's thorn. That's what he's titled it. And we're going to make break this into two different sessions, and then that we'll be done with this book. So I'm going to go ahead and begin, and it's called Paul's Thorn. And lest, for fear that, I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then uh, am I strong. This is Paul's, what he wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Hallelujah. One of the most prevalent objections raised today against the ministry of healing is Paul's thorn in the flesh. One traditional idea has led to another. There is a widespread teaching that God is the author of disease. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. And that he has chosen some of the most devout of his children to remain sick and glorify him by exhibiting fortitude and patience. Just just reading that is hard for me to do. This has no doubt led to the idea that Paul had a sickness that God refused to heal. Talk about the lies of the devil. We do not believe that anyone who would take time to read all that God has to say on the subject of healing would ever form such a conclusion. I am quick to admit that equally devout men may hold contrary views, not only on this point, but on the whole subject of divine healing. It is merely a matter of study and investigation. Many good men whose teaching has been the age of miracles is past, etc., while reading the scriptures, have thoughtlessly passed over the Bible teaching on healing, believing it not applicable for our day. Nearly all who have spoken and written against us have not hesitated to use our name and go after us with a hammer and tongs, but they have never attempted to answer the scriptural arguments that we have presented in our sermons on the subject. We have carefully, without mentioning their names, read their statements publicly and answered them from the scriptures. If we were fighting against flesh and blood, we would name them and go after them with a vengeance, but this would not be Christ-like. We feel disposed to keep our hands off God's servants and let him fight our battles for us. Now, that, that, is, that is approaching a subject in a godly way. We let God do the battle. We present our arguments, and we do not diminish or disregard or besmirch these other ministers and stuff. That's not what we are called to do. 
we are called to share the good news. Mr. Bosworth writes, before considering the subject of Paul's thorn, we quote the following from a stenographic report of a sermon preached by a prominent New York clergyman. He also revised his sermon, printed it in great quantities, and distributed it in every home in the vicinity of our revival. Although we had practically no knowledge of what he taught, having never seen or heard us, he sought to offset our teaching on healing. Among other things, he said, the fact is, Paul was sick. This is what this other minister wrote. He was the sickest of men. He had one of the worst and most painful of oriental diseases. He had ophthalmia, a disease of the eyes. The proof that he had it is overwhelming. He tells us that he had a thorn in the flesh. When Paul stood before Christians, his eyes filled with an unspeakable pus, unspeakable looking matter running down over his face. Why would they have gouged out their eyes for him except that his eyes, as he stood before them, were a pitiful and appealing sight to them as the eyes of anyone with that ophthalmia are? The particular pain of this disease is that it is like a stake in the eyes. It is beyond dispute that Paul was a sick man. He says so himself, Paul did not get this disease by infection. How did he get it? Jesus Christ gave it to him. Paul did not want to be sick. He prayed to the Lord to heal him of this sickness. He prayed not once nor twice, but three times. He received no answer to his prayers. In spite of all of his praying, he got no healing. His thrice offered prayer brought him no cure, not even the hint of healing. That is not all, this man wrote. The Lord said to Paul a very startling thing. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. He tells Paul it is better for him to be sick than to be well. He tells Paul it is the divine will. He shall not be cured. He tells Paul divine power can and will operate in and through him better with this ophthalmia and the sickness than without it. Hear what Paul has to say in response to the Lord concerning this infirmity and the will of the Lord that he shall not be cured of it. These are his words. Most gladly, therefore, I will Will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Here is Paul saying just this. I will glory in my ophthalmia. My eyes may be full of repulsive discharges. I may be the object of pity. No matter, I will glory in it. I will rejoice in my sickness in the quivering flesh and painful suffering of his apostle, the Lord has written his divine protest against this unspeakable doctrine, this brutal transmutation of the cross of Christ into the center of physical healing. <coughs> Excuse me. In answering our brother's arguments on this point, we will state first that the expression the thorn in the flesh, is not once used in either the Old Testament or New Testament except as an illustration. The figure of the thorn in the flesh is not in one single instance used in the Bible as a figure of sickness. Every time the expression is used in the entire Bible, it is specifically stated exactly that the thorn in the flesh was, as we shall see. For instance, 
in Numbers 3355, Moses told the children of Israel before they entered the land of Canaan, if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Here the scripture itself plainly tells us that the pricks in the eyes and the thorns in the sides of the Israelites were the inhabitants of Canaan and not eye trouble or sickness. These teachers contend that Paul's thorn must have been a bodily affliction because Paul says that the thorn was in the flesh. I answer that. In the case of these Israelites, the scripture says, pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides. But this does not mean that God was to stick Canaanites in their eyes and sides with their heels dangling outside. God was only illustrating to show that as a thorn sticking in the flesh is annoying, so the Canaanites would, if left remaining, be a constant annoyance to the children of Israel. Again, eight years later, Joshua 23.13 says, Concerning the heathens, nations of Canaan, they shall be scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes. So we see again that the scourges in their sides and the thorns in their eyes were Canaanites and not sore eyes or sore sides. It is here again and in all other instances plainly stated what the thorn was. Among the last words of David, we read, the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns. Without an exception, in all these cases, the thorns are personalities. As in each of these instances, it definitely states what the thorn was. So Paul definitely states what his thorn was. He said it was a messenger, that's in Greek it's angelos, of Satan, or as translated by others, the angel of the devil, Satan's angel, etc. This Greek word angelos appears 188 times in the Bible and is translated angel 181 times and messenger the other seven times. In all 188 times in the entire Bible, it is in every case a person and not a thing without a solitary exception. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels or messengers. And an angel or a messenger is always a person that one person sends to another and never a disease. Paul not only tells us that his thorn was an angel of Satan, but he also tells us what the angel came to do, to buffet me. Or as a Rotherham translates it, that he might be buffeting me. Now the word buffet means to blow after blow, as when the waves buffet a boat and as they buffeted Christ. Accordingly, Weymouth translates Satan's angels dealing blow after blow. Since buffeting means repeated blows, if Paul's buffeting was a disease, it would have to have been many diseases or the same disease many times repeated to be called buffeting. I'm going to pause here for a second and tell you that it's important that as we study the word, and in Timothy, Timothy is told by Paul to study the word, to show himself approved, that even today we need to study the word. And how do you do that sometimes? You need to get some other books. You need to get some other helps. And sometimes you have to go back into the Greek. Sometimes you have to go back into the Hebrew. And you have to find out what the nuances of those words were. Without doing that, we can miss an understanding. And people have missed this. He continues and writes, 
In speaking of this message or angel, Rotherham uses a pronoun he, and Weymouth's translation states, as for this, three times I besought the Lord to rid me of him. Both of these translators use personal pronouns, he and him, when speaking of Paul's thorn. These two pronouns, as well as the word angel or messenger, prove that Paul's thorn was, as he himself plainly shows, a satanic personality and not a disease. I don't know about you, but when I had know someone and they may have a disease, say they have leprosy, I don't call that disease a he or him. If they've got COVID, I don't call it a she or a her. <coughs> we could not use the personal pronoun he or him when speaking of ophthalmia or any other disease because there is no gender in ophthalmia. Suppose I should ask a man how his cancer was. What would you think if you heard him reply? He is lots worse and I am suffering terribly. Now, since Paul distinctly states that his thorn was an angel of Satan sent to buffet him, a demon spirit sent from Satan to make trouble for him wherever he went, why should we say it is something else? Folks, when we get in and study the word, we can plainly see that it is not a disease he is talking about, but a personality, a person, and in this case, a demonic spirit. Soon after Paul's conversion, God said to Ananias, I will show him how great things must he must suffer for my name's sake, not by sickness, but by the persecutions, which Paul enumerates as his buffetings. Paul had persecuted the Christians from place to place, and now he was beginning to experience the same and greater persecutions, specifying the buffetings instigated by Satan's angel. Paul goes on to say, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul first mentions infirmities, for he realized, and every Christian should realize, his weakness and inability in his own strength to stand up against a satanic messenger, to pass triumphantly through reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses, and all the other buffetings he elsewhere catalogs. This is why he besought the Lord three times to be rid of him, the messenger who was buffeting him so severely and in so many ways. Christ responded to his thrice repeated prayer, not by removing the satanic messenger, but by saying, my grace, which is for the inner man is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When Paul saw that the grace of God was sufficient to strengthen him to bear all these things, he exclaimed, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. How could it be that Christ's strength was made perfect in Paul's weakness if he was left weak or unless Paul was an actual partaker of Christ's strength, which would remove the weakness whether it was physical or spiritual? Without God's strength being imparted to him, is a man powerful when he is weak, either physically or spiritually? Paul saw that the grace of God given to him made his very buffetings, even his imprisonments, to work together for his good to turn out for the furtherance of the gospel. 
What servant of God has not learned, and probably more than once, that it is when he is most conscious of his own weakness that the power of Christ rests upon him the most? It is when he is consciously weakest in himself that he is the strongest because of depending not on his own, but on his divine strength. Folks, this is where I'm going to stop today. We need to realize that if we should hear that lie of Satan come out of a minister's mouth or we run across it in a book, we hear it in a sermon, whatever, we need to recognize the lie for what it is. Someone is teaching a false doctrine there. Why? I guess they want you to stay sick. I guess they don't want you to grab a hold of 1 Peter 2.24 that says, by his stripes you were healed. They don't want you to walk by faith where you can look, you can declare that thing taken care of, you can declare your healing. And then even while you still have symptoms, even while you may still look like you're sick, that you claim by his stripes I was healed. That's what the word says. I cannot lie against the word. This is what the word says. I'm going to stand on the word. In faith, I'm going to stand on the word. Isn't that what we're called to do? Aren't we called to stand and believe in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he provided for us? Aren't we to claim our salvation by faith? In the same way, we declare our healing by faith, by and through Jesus Christ. There's more. We'll do this on another episode. But I want you to grab a hold of. I want you to spend time in Mark 11, chapter 11, where he talks about faith, that we have to have that, the faith, the God kind of faith, the faith of God. That's where we want to stand when it comes to healing. We want to stand on what the word says and not what somebody else thinks it says. We don't want to be left astray. I know I don't want to be. I was so, um, how should I put it? When I came into the Word of Faith movement, when I started hearing the ministry of the Word from the pulpit here at this church, I grabbed a hold of it and I said, I've never heard of this before. You mean to tell me that I can break curses off myself? That I can claim healing for my body? and see it manifested, that I can have hands laid on me and that I can be healed? Yeah, I found that out. I found it to be true. And I've tried to share this for years and years with other people where I would pray for them, where I would share with them, where I would give them the word to where they could explore it and they could receive their healing. I want you to have that. Thank you for joining me today. God bless you, and we'll be back again next week. If you need prayer, please call our prayer line. We have prayer partners who are ready to pray for you. If you have received a healing or have any other testimony to share as a result of this broadcast, we would love to hear about it. Please call us, write, or send us a message through our website. To find out more about this program and other programs by Grace City Church and its ministries, please visit our website at gracecitychurch.tv. This production is made possible by the generous support from the friends and partners of Grace City Church and Finishers International Ministries.